Hey, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, and today we're talking about the rock in Matthew 16, verse 18. Actually, if we look at the uh, the extended version, it's Matthew 16, 17 through 19, which is what we'll be talking about today. And I've got Jimmy Aiken, the guy below me, and I've got Dr. Stephen Nemesh also here. He's been on the channel a bunch. Jimmy's been on one time before. And what were we talking about? Thanksgiving? I think it was around the, t the time of Thanksgiving, yeah. right? We talked about a, a it, specific saint. It was Thanksgiving, and um, I believe it was St. Teresa. I love that show. And Jimmy, we've had a couple conversations as well, but I'm just, I'm so looking forward to tonight. This is, uh, this is really special. And we've got a lot of really cool things planned, so you definitely want to stick around to the very end. And I, I did, I, I meant to ask this while we were still in pre-show, but are, are you guys both open to doing some Q&A with the audience? Of course. Okay. Yeah, I'd like that. All right. So, so the plan is to go for around two hours. We'll do dialogue for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Then we'll do, uh, we'll switch over to some Q&A. How's that sound? And I, I also just, I, I felt, and again, this is kind of stuff we should have discussed before the show, but I feel like uh, it made sense that Jimmy would go first, and we've got a couple slides prepared for him, and then we'll get to uh, the two slides that we've got for you, Stephen. How do you feel about that? Good. Great. Awesome. All right. So before we... Oh, go ahead. It looks like you're about well, to say something. Well, I have a, have a question. Um, so yeah. uh, one of the things that is important in approaching any given uh, biblical text is figuring out all the possible things it could mean before trying to narrow it down to a specific meaning. And um, uh, Stephen just recently published a piece on that and had a video about that where he lays out a whole bunch of different possible meanings. And I didn't know if he wanted to explore those possible meanings before he and I try to get down to which meaning we think is correct. That sounds good so, to me. I I, so I, I did make that video recently. Um, I think, like you said, it's important to clarify the, the sort of the initial possibilities of the text. Um, I'm going to be more committed to a particular reading. So I'm going to be arguing that there is one particular reading. I'm, I'm going to have a definite point of view that I'm defending here. Uh, but I guess it, would, it wouldn't be too bad, I suppose, if, if we just sort of mentioned a couple of the options that are in the air. Uh, so the principal question then is, who is this rock on which the church is built? Uh, one possibility is that it's Peter. Uh, one possibility is that it's Jesus. One possibility is that... Um, I, I'll, I'll say that those are sort of two major possibilities, those are two big umbrella possibilities. Uh, and then within those categories, we could say that it's Peter as an individual, or we could say that it's Peter uh, in virtue of confessing Christ as the Messiah. Uh, we could say that it's Peter in a way that applies to him and certain people as his successors. We can say that it is Peter in a way that could apply in principle to any Christian. Um, so there are a lot of different, uh, theoretical possibilities in interpreting this text. And a lot of, you find a lot of these raised by the church fathers in their readings. Uh, so for example, Origen in his commentary on Matthew will say that anybody who confesses with true faith through the inspiration of God, the father, that, uh, Christ is the, Jesus is the Christ and the son of God. That person also is a Peter and serves as a rock for the church. Uh, and is, is the church is built on such a person. Um, Chrysostom says that the, the rock on which the church is built is the faith that Peter confesses. Um, Augustine has a variety of interpretations that he gives. Sometimes he says that Christ is the rock. Sometimes he says that Peter's confession of faith is the rock. Sometimes he'll say that Peter um, confesses faith and receives the keys as representative of the entire church and not only as an individual. So there are a lot of interpretive possibilities in front of us, and you'll find precedents for just about any of these interpretations in the, uh, the church fathers and in contemporary commentators as well. Uh, so that it's true. That's one thing that I did mention recently in the course of this discussion, I'm going to be committing to a particular view. Um, but it is good to get, get it out in the open that there are a variety of views about how to interpret this passage. And some people even say that this is like perhaps the most controversial passage in the whole new Testament. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to interpret. There have been a lot of interpretations proposed throughout the years. Um, so mm -hmm. I, it, I think you're right. It's important that we first get it out there in the open that 
there has not been a sort of a unanimous agreement on one particular interpretation of this text throughout the years. There's been a variety of views that have been proposed by significant figures. Uh, but in the course of the discussion, I am going to be offering one particular view. I'm going to be spending most of my time and energy defending the view that Christ himself is the rock. Okay. Just to quickly summarize what you just said. Now, there are a bunch of these different variations, like it's Jesus or it's Peter in one way or another. There are different ways of understanding that. You also mentioned briefly a kind of middle position, which is also common. I just want to call that out so people are aware of it, which is that the rock is, it's sometimes expressed as Peter's faith. So it's not Peter himself. It's not Jesus. It's Peter's faith. Or sometimes it's said to be uh, the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. It's that theological fact, um, which is the, what constitutes Peter's faith. It seems to me that there, those are sort of the three basic positions, and then there are variations on them. Yeah, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. So, Cam, how would you like us to proceed? Yeah, I, good question. I was uh, I was just enjoying the back and forth already. I wanted to just like take a back seat. But uh, before we get it into the discussion, I actually wanted to do something. The first time on the channel, we actually have a sponsor. And I wanted to let, I know this is super exciting. I wanted to let you know about a guy, his name is Mark Lozano. I actually have a picture of him here. This is him and his family. And uh, I've been talking with Mark and I just felt like it was time to sponsor with someone like this. And his story, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually really interesting. So he started out as an atheist and he married, or I, th I think this is the correct way that the story goes, is that he hooked up with his wife and they were battling back and forth for a while because he grew up, he grew up an atheist and his wife was a Christian. And so they started to battle and then he started to look into the evidence for Christianity and he was expecting to basically persuade her of his atheism. But what happened is that he actually got persuaded of Christianity. And at the time, he was working for the MBA, actually. And he was doing all of this sort of, all of these different investments. And he had all of these different financial assets that he was uh, investing in. And he, what he realized after he became a Christian is that a lot of these investment opportunities that he was doing were just unethical with his newfound Christian faith. So he basically almost liquidated all of his assets and then started this new ministry or this uh, this business, Christ-Centered Capital. That's actually the name of the ministry. You can you can go, um, I, I suppose it's also a ministry, but it's also a business, ChristCenteredCapital.com. There's a, actually, we have a promo code if you want to sign up, BTW, by the way, CC. You can get your first month for $1. And basically what he does is he is a, uh, he provides an analysis of different stocks and investments, but it's like a moral analysis. And so it's it's almost like an ethical screening of various financial assets like stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, bonds, cryptos are really big right now, Real even like real estate and cars. There's all sorts of different things that you can invest in right now that are Christ-centered. <clears throat> and so what he does is he provides a, a weekly report of the most talked about investable assets. And what you can do actually for free is you can go to his website and you can sign up for their newsletter. I think it's a once once a month newsletter with Christian related market news, stuff like that. But I definitely want you to go check him out. I mean, his story is amazing. I'm actually going to be interviewing him in person here very soon. But I just wanted to uh, let you know about our guy, Mark Lozano over at Christ Centered Capital. Uh, again, ChristCenteredCapital.com. By the way, CC, you get your first month for one dollar. All right, let's get back into the dialogue for today. So I think it's best now, like I mentioned, to turn now to Jimmy, your view. And I've, we've okay. got all these slides prepared and everything. So just coach me through when to put the slides up and I'll do that. And then we'll just uh, let the, con the conversation sort of develop organically. Okay. So um, I guess I should start by saying that I was raised in a nominally Protestant household, and when I was 20 years old, I had a, a profound conversion to Christ, and I fell in love with God's Word. I w decided I wanted to devote my career to God's Word, and at the time, I planned on being a sem Protestant seminary professor and or pastor, and I wanted to make sure that I did not reflexively fall into a particular theological tradition just because 
the church I was attending was in convenient driving distance. You know, that's not really a good theological test for truth. Neither is which church has a preacher I like or which church has music I like. So I made a point of studying the theology of all the different uh, Christian traditions, including Catholicism, but I was at one point very anti-Catholic, and so I didn't believe in the office of the papacy, and I didn't believe Peter was the rock. And the way I would have articulated that at the time I would have said, okay, Greek, Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter using the word Petros, and on this rock, using the Greek word Petra, I will build my church. And I would say, okay, well, Petros is different than Petra, and I had always heard that Petros referred to a small stone, whereas Petra referred to a large rock. And so I would say to myself, okay, so what Jesus is doing here is he's contrasting Peter with the rock. This is what, if you want to be fancy, you could call antithetical parallelism. So he's saying, Peter, you're this little small stone, but on this great big rock, which is something else, I'm going to build my church. And the most natural understanding of what the great big rock was for me was that it's the revelation that uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, because that's just what they've been talking about. This uh, passage occurs right after Jesus has said, who do men say that I am? And the apostles propose various answers. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so that confession that theological fact, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's what I took the rock to be. And I, so I thought I could defend that. That was my view. But one day I was reading the passage, and I started to notice structures in it that made me rethink my position. In fact, it, they made me change my position on the spot, because I realized these are so compelling, they're even obvious in English, you don't need to even go to the Greek to see this, and they required that Peter be the rock. But before we get to that, and I'll show you those structures, but before we get to that, I want to mention, notice that I was making an assumption with regard to how the parallelism was working. I was assuming that Jesus was contrasting Peter with the rock, that this was antithetical parallelism. Peter, you look like a little small rock, but on this other great big thing, I'm going to build my church. Well, that's not the only way parallelism works. It can also work not antithetically, but synthetically, where the parallel builds on what has just been said. And the way you'd understand the passage in that case is you may look like a little small stone, Peter, but on the great big rock that you really are, I will build my church. And so we can't simply assume that if there is a difference in meaning between Petros and Petra, that Jesus is contrasting Peter with the rock. He may be using the image of the rock to build on Peter and magnify Peter, Say, you may look like a little stone, but you're really a big rock in God's eyes, and I'm going to use that. Also, notice there's a second assumption in there, which is that these words have different meaning. Now, for us non-Greek speakers or non-native Greek speakers, it can be easy to say, well, Petros has a different ending than Petra. Petros ends in OS or Omega Sigma or Omicron S, whereas Petra ends in an alpha, in an A, so they must have different meaning. But that's not true. Um, even in English, you can have very dissimilar words that have the same meaning, like rock and stone. If I go outside and I pick up a rock, or if I go outside and I pick up a stone, they mean the same thing, even though rock and stone are two completely different words. And so we have to look not at just the form of the word, but how were Petros and Petra actually used. And if you check the scholarly literature on this, you'll find that New Testament scholars, including Protestant scholars like D.A. Carson, will admit that in some early Greek poetry, several hundred years before the time of Christ, Petros and Petra could be used in this small stone, large rock distinction, but that it wasn't consistently that way, 
and that this difference in meaning was basically gone by the time of the New Testament. It wasn't part of New Testament Greek. And so we've got a real problem if we want to draw a rigid distinction on uh, the difference between Petros and Petra. Also, this is this conversation in all likelihood wasn't occurring in Greek. It was occurring in Aramaic, as indicated by various Aramaisms that are in the passage. And in Aramaic, the word that would have been used in both cases, as many Protestant scholars will admit, was kepha, which is where we get kephas, the Greek form of Peter's name. That's why he's called Cephas in the New Testament. It's just bringing kepha over into Greek and then into English. So according to many Protestant scholars, there wouldn't have even been a difference in the wording in, um, in the original Aramaic conversation. Having said that, that was all in the future. I didn't know that when I noticed these structures, but I started noticing these structures. So Cam, if you could put up the first slide, I'll show people what those structures are. Jesus has just said, as we mentioned, who do you say that I am? And they propose different things. And then he says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in response to that, Jesus makes three statements, one after the other, which I've labeled here A, B, and C. The A statement is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he's referring there, of course, to the fact that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. The second, or B statement, that he makes to Peter is, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. And then the third or C statement he makes is, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the first thing I noticed once I realized that the passage was structured in this very careful way was that I had to take the context of the surrounding statements into account when trying to interpret that middle statement, you are Peter. On the view that I had always previously advocated, I understood that to be Jesus running down Peter, saying, oh, Peter, you're this little tiny stone, you're insignificant, but on this great rock of my identity, I will build my church. But that doesn't fit the context. If you look at the first statement, the A statement, why don't we go to the second slide now? Um, if you look at that first statement, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, well, that's clearly a blessing. Jesus is pronouncing a blessing on Peter. He's not running him down. He's magnifying him. He's saying how blessed he is. And if you look at the third statement that Jesus makes to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that also is clearly a blessing. That is not running Peter down. That is magnifying Peter by giving him this amazing gift. And so it really wouldn't scan logically if you read this as, blessed are you, Simon. make sense uh -oh. for Jesus to, to... Jimmy, you, you kind of cut out for just a second. Just, just back up about okay. one sentence. Okay. So it really wouldn't make sense uh, if Jesus is saying, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You're an insignificant pebble. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. If the first statement and the second sta the third statement are both blessings on Peter, then we should interpret the middle statement in its context and say that's also a blessing. He's not running Peter down. He's blessing Peter by giving us by giving him this name. Now, I also noticed each of these three statements, A, B, and C, has a two-part follow-up. So why don't we go to the next slide? There we go. Um, the two-part follow-up explains or amplifies on the meaning of the initial statement. So in statement A, Jesus has said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And in, then in the two-part follow-up, he explains why Peter is blessed, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So that's why Peter's blessed. He's received this revelation of Jesus's identity from the Father. In the third statement, the C statement, Jesus has said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. 
And part of what that means is explained in the two-part explanation. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So that's part of what it means to have the keys. Well, if we've seen that in the case of the first statement and the third statement, the follow-up is an explanation of the meaning of the initial statement, the initial blessing on Peter, then we need to read that middle statement, the B statement, in context as well. And so when Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter, that is explained by the reason he calls him Peter is, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. That's what it means for Peter to for Simon Barjona to be Peter. He's the rock on which Jesus will build his invincible church. So when I realized that, I had to conclude the other arguments I had were weak compared to this. This structure is so obvious, you can see it even in English, and it points to Peter being the rock when you read it in context. Why don't we go to the next slide? Now, one of the things that you frequently find in the New Testament when you, um, when you are looking at a sequence that is structured is it'll fit one of two patterns. Either it will build up to the, the last element in the sequence being the important point, or very frequently, it will uh, have the center point being the most significant. You see this in a variety of literary structures in both the Old and the New Testament. For example, in uh, the flood narrative in Genesis 6 through 9, it's a structure that it, scholars call it a chiasmus. It's a kind of inverted pyramid structure where you've got uh, 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 you kind of come up one slope of it, and then you've got its capstone, and then you come down the other side of it, just like a pyramid. And in the case of the flood narrative, the center point is the important point. God remembered Noah. That's the center point of that whole big literary structure, and that's the important thing in the flood. Not just the flood happened, the important thing, and why we're all still here, is God remembered Noah. You see the same kind of thing in the Gospels, like in the, especially in the Gospel of Mark. It's often called a Mark and Sandwich, where Mark will have an important thing inserted or sandwiched between two other somewhat less important things. And you see that, for example, in the cursing of the fig tree. In Mark's Gospel, the um, Jesus curses the fig tree, which is a, an enacted parable of him cursing the temple. Then they go clear the temple, that's the middle of the Mark and Sandwich, and then on the other side of that, they come back and they see the fig tree withered. So really, the fig tree narrative is a kind of enacted parable about the coming destruction and condemnation of the temple. Well, here, it seems to me that that middle statement, that's the key one. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's kind of the big declaration. Um, let's go to the next slide. If you look at that first point, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, well, that's good, but it seems subsidiary. It doesn't seem as important as that central statement, because it's just a blessing on Peter. I mean, he learned this from God, and that's great, but it's not as important as Jesus is going to build his church, and it will survive forever. Similarly, if you look at the third statement, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, part of what that means is you'll be able to bind and loose, which has to do with governing authority within the church. But governing authority within the church is not as important as the church itself. So once again, that central point, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the central point that Jesus is making. And in fact, that's also indicated by the overall structure in Matthew 16. Really, when you think about it, this whole section where Jesus has asked about his identity, who do people say that I am, and then he turns, he's really using that as an excuse to get to this point to talk about Peter's identity. So you have two people being discussed in this passage, Jesus and Peter, and really what Matthew is doing in this section is talking about Jesus' identity, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
And then Jesus uses that to talk about Peter's identity. He's the rock on which the church will be built. So I would say that based on a variety of considerations, including the obvious literary structuring that is going on here, Peter is very clearly the rock. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't have other meanings, too. Scripture is multi-layered and has multiple layers of meaning, so I don't exclude other readings. But if you ask what's the primary literal sense of the text, Peter is the rock. All right, let's turn it over now to Stephen. Where would you like to begin? Would you like to respond to some things that he said here, or would you like to go ahead and just go ahead? Why don't I just present my case first, and then maybe we can have some kind of back and forth after that? Okay, sounds good. Uh, so if you would, I'll, so I, you can pull up my first slide, but you don't have to keep it up as I'm talking. It's just once I move to the next point, then maybe you could bring it up again, if that's fine with you. Sure. Okay, so I want to present five reasons for thinking that Jesus is the Petra, the rock on which the church is built in this passage. Um, I don't know that any one of these arguments is going to be perfectly convincing, but I think that taken cumulatively, taken together, they make a, a pretty good case. Uh, so let's start with this first one, the talk about the Petras Petra distinction. Um, like Jimmy was saying, pretty much all contemporary commentators on this text admit two things. Uh, the first, that Petras and Petra mean the same thing. Uh, these two words, by the time of Matthew's composition, have the same meaning. On that, you can see D.A. Carson and other commentators. Uh, second, that Christ, originally speaking in Aramaic, would have used the same word twice, namely kepha. Uh, and uh, he would have said, you are kepha and on this kepha. Uh, so a lot of people today, uh, commentators, don't really have much patience for the idea that because Matthew is using two different words, therefore he, he doesn't think Jesus is referring to the same thing. Um, and a lot of the reasons, a lot of times they will give these reasons why not to take this argument seriously, because the words mean the same thing in any case, um, and Jesus would have been using the, the same word in Aramaic. But I think actually that this argument can be turned around, because granted that the two words mean the same thing, and the fact that Jesus would have used the same word kepha twice in the original, there is no reason for Matthew to have Jesus say Petra at all in this passage, unless he means to distinguish between Petra. Petras, Pe Peter, uh, and some other thing, Petra. Uh, so in my reading, the fact that Matthew uses two different words there is actually an evidence that he does not understand Jesus to be referring to Peter in both cases. He says to Simon, sue Petros, you are Peter, kai epi taute te Petra, and on this Petra. Now, why does he use two different words if the words Petras and Petra mean the same thing? He could have just said, sue Petros, kai epi tuto te to Petra. He could have just said Petra in both cases. But he doesn't. He says Petra. He says Petras first, and Petra the second time. Um, this, to me, m to my mind, is um, an evidence that he does not believe that Jesus was referring to the same person. Simon is being called Petras because he is of the Petra, whereas Jesus is referring to himself as the Petra on which the church is built. Um, and this is exactly the interpretation that Augustine gives in his Sermon 26 on the New Testament. He says that Peter is named Peter after the rock, just like uh, Christ is not named after the Christian, but the Christian is named after, the, after Christ. Okay, so just like we are called Christians and our name of Christian comes from Christ, who is Christ, and we're named after him. So also Simon is called Petros, not because he is the Petra on which the church is built, but because he stands in a certain relation to that Petra through, in virtue of his confession of faith. So Simon is Petros. He is of the Petra. That's what Petros means here, of the Petra. Um, and Christ himself is the Petra on which the church is built. Why do I say that? Because once more, Petros and Petra ordinarily mean the same thing. And Christ in Aramaic would have used the same words twice. So therefore, if... Matthew understood Jesus as referring to Peter as the rock on which the church is built. He could have just said epi tuto to Petro. He could have just used the word Petras twice, but he doesn't. He uses Petras to refer to Simon and Petra to refer to this thing on which the church is built. So to my mind, that in that suggests that he understood Jesus to be referring to two different people or to two different things. So that's a that's a first argument. A second argument is this. Um, if you look at the way Matthew depicts Jesus and the way that Matthew depicts Simon in his gospel, um, it 
is entirely, I think, in consonant with the general picture that Matthew paints in order f- for us to think that Simon himself is the rock on which the church is built. So I'll start with the depiction of Jesus, and then I'll move on to the depiction of Simon. The depiction of Jesus in Matthew is of somebody who considers himself uniquely privileged and capable to teach people about God. Uh, he says, for example, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that his teachings are like whoever whoever follows his teachings uh, resembles a person who builds his house on the Petra, on the rock. And that house can withstand all the storms that might come its way because it was built on the Petra. Uh, later in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, he says that nobody knows the Father except for the Son and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal uh, him. So Jesus alone knows who God is, and Jesus alone is capable of revealing God to other people. In Matthew chapter 21, he says that he is the stone uh, that the builders rejected, and that later became the cornerstone on which the house was built. Now, admittedly, there he uses a different word. The word is lithos and not petra, but stone and rock are not such different things, once more. And then in Matthew chapter 23, in verses 8 through 10, Jesus says this, he says, you are not to be called instructors among his disciples. He says, you are not to be called instructors uh, because you all have one instructor, the Messiah. And he says, you are all brothers. Okay, so the way that Jesus is presented in Matthew is as a uniquely privileged teacher about God, about the only person who can teach other people about God. And the person who follows uh, follows his teachings is like somebody who builds his house on a Petra that can withstand all the storms. And all of his disciples are not to think of themselves as teachers or to think of themselves as any sort of hierarchy. They are rather all brothers and they only have one teacher, namely Jesus. The depiction of Peter, on the other hand, in Matthew's gospel is almost universally negative. Peter almost cannot do anything right. This is the one episode in Matthew's gospel where it seems that Peter is depicted in a positive light. Uh, But before this, he does things that are bad. And after this, he does the depiction of Peter seemingly gets worse. So, for example, he falls into the ocean or he falls into the lake uh, when he's walking on the water because of his lack of faith. Um, immediately after this episode, he rebukes Jesus uh, for teaching that he should uh, be killed and resurrect from the dead. And Jesus re- rebukes him back and he calls him Satan. Uh, later on, Peter seems unwilling to forgive. He says, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody even seven times in a day? Uh, He asks what material benefits and compensations can they expect for following Jesus. Um, And then what's most interesting of all is that the very last mention of Peter, explicit mention of Peter in the Gospel of Matthew, is the fact that he denies Jesus three times and then he goes away to to weep bitterly. After that moment in in which Peter denies Christ and he weeps bitterly, there is no more mention of Peter in Matthew's Gospel at all. Now, it's true that when Jesus resurrects, the 11 go to meet him at the mountain. Okay, but Peter is not mentioned by name. There is no story in Matthew's gospel of Peter's uh, restoration to Jesus like there is in John. There is no mention in Matthew's gospel of um, Peter being reconciled to Jesus and to the rest of the disciples. He disappears into the crowd by the time you get to the end of the uh, by the time you get to the end of the gospel. Um, So if you think that Peter is the rock, you have the unfortunate effect of turning Matthew into a polemic against Petrine premacy because Peter never acts like a rock. And the last thing that Matthew mentions about Peter is the fact that he, he denies Jesus three times and he weeps bitterly. So the second point that I want to make is that it's entirely in consonant with the way that uh, Matthew depicts Jesus and the way that Matthew depicts Peter to suppose that Peter himself should be the rock on which the church is built. Now, this depiction of Peter in Matthew's gospel has even led, uh, for example, the scholar Stan Gundry to write a book where he thinks that for Matthew and for Matthew's community, Peter was an apostate and a false disciple. I think that's extreme. I wouldn't go that far, but I do agree with him that the depiction of Peter in Matthew's gospel is so negative that it does not make any sense. It is totally in consonant with, uh, with Matthew's depiction of Peter that he should be the rock on which the church is built. So that's my second reason. Okay, so once more, my first reason is that Matthew uses two different words, even though every commentator grants that he did not have to in principle. The fact that he uses two different words means that he's referring to two different people. The second point that I would make is that Matthew's depiction of Jesus and his depiction of Simon in the gospel would not fit if you think that Simon is the rock, because 
Simon is almost never depicted positively. The depiction of Simon gets more negative after chapter 16. And the last time Simon is even mentioned by name is when he denies Jesus three times and he weeps bitterly. So I think it's just totally in consonant with the depiction of things in Matthew to suppose that he's the rock. Now, somebody might say at this point, okay, but it, it looks like he's talking to Peter. He says, you are Peter and on this rock. It doesn't make any sense, therefore, that he would be changing reference. Well, I think actually that there is an interesting parallel with this text and some other instance in the New Testament where Jesus seems to be referring to himself, even though contextually you would be expecting him to be referring to something else. And that's in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple. He drives out the money changers and the money lenders and so on. Um, and then the Jews come to him and they say, on whose authority are you doing this? And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And then the Jews ask him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you're going to rebuild it in two days or in three days. But then John comments and he says, but he was referring to the temple of his body. So notice what's happening here. Every reasonable person would understand Jesus in context to be referring to the building because he says this temple and he's in the temple building. And that's what makes sense uh, in the context. So it, it's reasonable to suppose that he's talking about his um, his. Uh, the building that he's in, but actually he's talking about himself. So Jesus can confusingly and counter contextually refer to himself by using a phrase like this temple. And he can still be referring to himself, even though context might makes, it might make better sense in context that he'd be referring to something else. Well, that's the same thing that's going on here, according to my reading. Okay. So once more, if we accept Augustine's interpretation that Petros means of the rock and Christ is the Petra, then you can see why Jesus is using two different words here or why Matthew makes Jesus use two different words. He says to Simon, you are Petros, you are of the rock, and epitaute te Petra, on this rock, which I am, I will build my church. Uh, so there is a, 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 a parallel here between the way that Jesus confusingly refers to himself sort of against the expectations established by context in John chapter two and what's going on here in Matthew chapter 16. So that's my third argument. Um, my fourth argument, if you would bring up the slides once more, the rest of the New Testament. Okay, so let's take a look for a second about how the rest of the New Testament talks about Jesus and talks about Matthew or talks about Peter. Okay, because I've given arguments right now strictly from Matthew and then I mentioned a, a comparison with John. But let's mention the rest of this. You will not find a single statement in all of the New Testament to the effect that Jesus or excuse me, that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. Um, that sentence does not exist anywhere in Paul. It doesn't exist in Peter's writings. It doesn't exist in the other Gospels. The only time you ever have something like that sentence is here in Matthew. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Um, on the other hand, when the rest of the New Testament does talk about the foundation of the church, it says two things. It says that Christ is the foundation and it says that Christ together with the apostles are the foundation of the church. But you will never find another statement in all of the New Testament that singles out Peter as the foundation of the church. Now, my thinking is that if this is what Jesus actually did mean to say to Peter here, then you would see more corroboration of this elsewhere in the New Testament, but it doesn't exist. Another interesting fact to note is that there are only two cases in all of the New Testament where somebody, where God or Jesus refers to Simon as Peter and he calls him the name Peter. Okay, there are only two instances in the New Testament where this happens. That's in Luke chapter 22, where John, where, where Jesus says to him, I tell you, Peter, on this, you know, before the cock crows, you are going to deny me three times. And the second time is in Acts chapter 10, verse 13, where the voice in the vision says to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, notice what's going on. In both of these cases, Simon is particularly acting not like the rock that the church, not like a rock on which the church can be built. In Luke Jesus tells him, Peter, you are going to deny me three times uh, before, the, before the rooster crows. And then in Acts chapter 10, he is being told by God to do something and he refuses it. So the only times in the whole New Testament where he is called Peter by someone who is not a Christian, by God or by Jesus, right? The only times he's called Peter is when he's precisely not acting like a rock. Um, apart from that, you will not find a sentence in all of the New Testament that says that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. Now, you could say that, of course, you know, people call him Peter all the time. He's called Cephas and he's called Petros. That's true, but that doesn't mean that he's there for the rock because there are other ways of interpreting the significance of that name for him. And I think that it would be circular in the present context to bring up that fact, because how we interpret what's happening here in Matthew 16 is going to inform 
our interpretation of this habit of the early Christians of calling him Cephas or Peter. So I don't think the mere fact that Christians call him Peter means very much. What we say about Matthew 16 is going to inform what we say about the rest of that. So my, my next argument is then you would expect further corroboration in the rest of the New Testament for the idea that Peter is the rock on which the church is built, but you don't find it. He is only called Peter by Jesus or by God in circumstances when he's not acting like the rock. So there's a kind of irony in the usage. And you will not find a sentence in all of Revelation or in all of Paul or in all of uh, anything else to the effect that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. That doesn't exist elsewhere. The only time the rest of the New Testament talks about the foundation of the church, it refers to Christ or to Christ together with the apostles. So I think that this is a further reason for not thinking of Peter as the Petra on which the church is built. And then finally, uh, notice here, okay, so if we open, if we go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says, you are Peter, you are Petros, and epitaute te Petra, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, against autes. Now this pronoun, it, autes, is ambiguous. It can refer to two things in the previous sentence. It can refer to Petra, or it can refer to ecclesia, church. Okay. Now, the normal reading is to have it is to understand it to refer to the church because that is the nearest noun in the sentence. But in principle, it can refer to Petra. And the reason why I think it refers to Petra is because in all of the New Testament, the church or Peter are never said to combat with Hades. All right. You won't find a sentence where the church and Hades are being put together in one and the same place. However, there are at least two places in the New Testament where Jesus is put in connection with Hades as its conqueror. The first place is Acts chapter 2, uh, where Peter talks about the resurrection of Christ, and he, he, um, he references a psalm that says, you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Okay, So Peter refers to Jesus as a conqueror of Hades in the Pentecost sermon, and furthermore, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus says, I, am, I was dead and I'm alive. I have the, key, the keys of death and of Hades. Uh, so in Revelation, Jesus is put in connection with Hades as its conqueror. In, Math, in Acts chapter 2, through the sermon of Peter and through an interpretation of the Psalms, uh, Jesus is once more put into connection with Hades as its conqueror. But you will not find a sentence in the New Testament that puts the church in connection with Hades like that. The church is not said to conquer Hades, uh, whereas Christ is. So for that reason, I think that when it says the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that it is the Petra. And that Petra is Christ uh, against whom the gates of Hades did not prevail because he rose from the dead. So... Um, these are then for my reasons for thinking that Christ is the Petra. Now, one point where I do agree with Jimmy is I do agree that there is a chiastic structure in this passage. Uh, so if you would, please put up my second. Um, yeah, that's the one. So one place where I think, uh, Jimmy, and you can respond to this, uh, I suppose, uh, after, after I'm finished here, and I should be finished soon. One point where I think, Jimmy, your argument is not perfectly convincing I think, for example, if you have verse 17 is about Peter, verse 19 is about Peter, okay? Um, from that, it does not follow that verse 18 is about Peter because you can have a chiastic structure. You don't need to have two verses on either extreme being about the same thing as the verse in the middle. The verse in the middle can be about something else. Um, so this is how I understand the chiastic structure in Matthew chapter six, 16. There is an initial statement about Peter's knowledge, there is a second statement about Peter's authority. There is a middle statement about Christ. And then it returns to this question about Peter's authority. And then it ends with another statement about Peter's knowledge. So here's how I will explain this. The first part is this. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in the heavens. That's a statement about Peter's knowledge. He knows who Jesus is. The second point is this. He says, and I tell you that you are Petros. You are of the rock. Okay, so... Scholars disagree about whether Simon already had this name or whether he was being awarded this name here. I think personally it doesn't matter. All that Petros means is that he is of the rock. Um, the middle statement, this is the important part. And on this Petra, on myself, on Christ, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, namely me, the Petra. So Jesus is saying, you know who I am. You live up to this name of Petros because you recognize me as the rock. I will build this church on myself, who am the rock. The gates of Hades will not prevail against me because I'm going to rise from the dead. 
And when Jesus raised, rises from the dead, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's another statement about uh, Simon's status or authority. He is going to be rewarded with the gospel of Christ's resurrection, which I understand to be the keys of the kingdom of heaven in keeping with uh, Zwingli. But I think also that you can make a case that this reading is in John Cassian and uh, Hilary of Poitiers. Um, and then finally, it terminates with another statement about knowledge. What you will bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And what you will loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Why is that? Because unlike the Pharisees who bound and loosed whatever they wanted, Peter is going to bind and loose in accordance with the gospel, in accordance with Jesus's teachings and the message of his resurrection. And he is going to make right decisions about what to bind and loose because he will be led by the gospel and not by his own ideas. So I agree with Jimmy that there is a chiastic structure. It's just I don't agree that if there is a chiastic structure or I don't agree that if verse 17 and 19 are about Peter, therefore verse 18 is about Peter. I think to the contrary, to the contrary it would be a truer chiasm if verse 18 is not principally about Peter at all, but rather about Christ. And then you return to a statement about Peter after that. Um, so that in brief is my view. Um, I think that there are very good reasons for denying that Peter is the rock. And I think that there are also very good reasons for holding that Christ himself is the rock. So like we said at the beginning, there are very many different interpretations of this passage throughout the history of the church. You will find one interpretation in Origen, one in Chrysostom, one in Augustine, one in Cassian, one in Hilary of Poitiers, and so on. Um, so there, there is not a sort of a uniform interpretation of this passage throughout history. I don't think either of us can claim to be giving the interpretation that everybody has always known. But I do think that um, a close consideration of these factors, for example, the use of the different words, um, the, the way that Jesus and Peter or Simon are depicted in Matthew's gospel, uh, the way that the rest of the New Testament talks about Peter and about Christ, um, this parallelism in John 2, and also this fact about conquering Hades. I think once you take all these things into consideration, a strong case can be made that Jesus and not Simon is the rock on which the church is built. So Jimmy, I'm going to go ahead and just let you come back in and because uh, Stephen's been going a while and I actually feel like I wasn't timing it, but I think that you guys almost went about the same amount of time. So I'm, and it was, it was great on both sides. So I'm just, I'm really looking forward to what's about to happen next. So Jimmy, pick up wherever you'd like to pick up. Well, it's, uh, it's, I, I, I thank uh, Stephen for uh, his presentation, and I, uh, and especially for pointing out some of the things we agree on. Um, it's a little hard to know where to start because there was so much there. Uh, one thing that Stephen did was appeal to various interpretations of the Church Fathers, and I think the Church Fathers are great. I think we should study their writings. In fact, I wrote a whole book about the writings of the Church Fathers. Um, I'm interested primarily, though, in what does the New Testament say? And I think that the New Testament very clearly indicates that in Matthew 16, Peter is the rock. Having said that, I want to point out that it is often neglected, and this can this can frequently be true in, uh, in apologetics, particularly in the Protestant community, um, it can often be neglected that the Church Fathers had what you can call a polyvalent understanding of Scripture. That means that they didn't see there as being just one meaning to a specific passage. Uh, the Church Fathers were perfectly comfortable with seeing multiple layers of meaning in various passages, including this one. And so, and I think you may have even alluded to this uh, in before your, your summary, Stephen, um, that Augustine has multiple views of what the rock is, and he doesn't see them as being in conflict. So in order to appeal to the Church Fathers, it is not sufficient from an apologetic perspective to say, well, here I have this early Christian writer who, in explaining this passage, mentions something other than Peter being the rock, because they could, as, as various ones of them did, hold multiple views of what the rock is. So what you really need is a church father denying that Peter is the rock, and that's something that is much harder to find. Even if you could find it, though, I care about what does the exegesis of the New Testament say, and I don't find the case that you made convincing because I, mean, I notice certain characteristics of it. One of the elements of your case 
instead of dealing with a let's walk through this step by step and see what we can make of the passage itself, I noticed a lot of leaping away from the immediate context and appealing to other places in the New Testament. Instead of trying to say, well, here we've got Matthew 16, verses 17 to 19, let's walk through them a piece at a time and see what they say and what we can figure out from the immediate context. There were regular appeals to things that are just elsewhere in the New Testament that are, at best, distant context. So that's just something I would reflect on. Now, in terms of your five arguments, the first one, Petros and Petra. Could I yeah. very briefly just make a response to, to what you said? Go if, ahead. If you would, before we get, because I, I don't want to lose track of uh, the things that are going on before. So uh, the first point that I would make, I, I agree with you that uh, what the New Testament says is more important than what the church fathers say. I agree with you entirely on that. Um, awesome. Because I think spoken that like a Protestant, church, of course, because the church fathers can be wrong. Um, but I want to make the point that I did not at any point appeal to the church fathers in justification of my uh, interpretation. I noted that my interpretation agreed with Augustine, but I didn't offer an interpretation on the basis of Augustine's authority. I just noted that fact. Um, and I also, um, for me, it would not matter if church fathers agreed with my interpretation or not. They could all be wrong as far as I'm concerned. Um, I only noted that what I'm saying is not totally without precedent uh, because other church fathers have not proposed this entire interpretation perhaps, but at least various components of it. So for example, on I do think that you have in Augustine's uh, Sermon 26 on the New Testament, you do have the idea that Peter is not the rock. He says that Peter is named after the rock uh, just as the Christian is named after Christ and not vice versa. So I do think that in Augustine, you have this idea that Peter so, is not the rock. But that okay. would that would be just one point. I, was there anything else you wanted to say? Because uh, I yes, don't want to get I, off into the weeds about let's exegete Sermon 26 of Augustine. No, of course. And I, I don't mean to, I, I don't care much, I don't care as much about what Augustine said as I do about this particular passage. So we don't have to get in. I was just clarifying the point that I was not justifying my exegesis by appeal to the church fathers. Um, okay. I was just trying neither, to show that. Neither am I. Although I would okay. note, just as a point of interest, lots of the church fathers agree with me too. So yeah, we don't want to falsely portray the, the ideas in the church fathers. No, of um, course. The second yeah, so point that I would make in response is is I I I don't agree with you that uh, I was interpreting this passage without getting into the weeds because the first two arguments that I gave were specifically limited to the Matthean text. So the argument about Petrus and Petra is an argument about Matthew, and the argument about the depiction of Jesus and Simon in Matthew is also an argument strictly about Matthew. So it's the first two arguments are strictly from the Matthean text itself. It's only once we get into the third, fourth, and fifth argument that we uh, we we start to branch out into the New Testament as a whole. So I, I don't think that it would be okay, fair to so say that my arguments are built from the whole New Testament only. I didn't say that. I said that you, t you tended to leap over the immediate context. And the immediate context is not the entire book of Matthew. In exegesis, you read any book on exegesis you want, It'll say, okay, you, when you're trying to interpret a passage, you need to look at that passage first. That's your primary source of information. Look at the immediate context. If you, you, after you've done that, you can then expand it to other things in the same document. That's a remote context. And then you can expand it to other books by the same author. That's an even more remote context. And then you can expand it to other books yet, which is the even more remote context. But your argument, with the exception of argument one, really didn't deal with the immediate context. Only the Petra, Petra's Petra argument did. And I don't find that convincing. I mean, I agree with you that Jesus could have said Petros twice, and he didn't. Well, why might that be? Well, hypothetically, it could be because he's changing the subject. And Petra refers to something different than Petros. I think for the reasons I indicated, that's not what's happening. It could be, here's option number two, if you if you do want to say that he's in meaning something different by the word Petra, like large stone, it could be he's using synthetic parallelism and saying, okay, Peter, you look like a little stone, but on the big rock you are in God's eyes, I'm going to build my church. Or on the big rock you're going to grow into, I'm going to build my church. Third possibility, 
simple stylistic variation. Uh, even in, in every language, we don't like repeating the same word too often in a row. And so we have things like pronouns and synonyms and alternate forms of the word. And that could be what's going on here. Jesus did just didn't, or Matthew rather, because this was really an Aramaic, Matthew just didn't want to repeat the word Petros that closely twice in succession. So he used a variant. He used a synonym for the same thing and expected his reader to pick up on the meaning. Just like if I was talking to a doctor named Stone, and I said to this doctor, let's say it's at an award ceremony and we're going to build a wing of the hospital in his honor. I could say, Dr. Stone, you're a marvelous physician. And on this rock, we're going to build a whole new wing of the hospital. Well, I just switched, made a shift even more dramatic than between Petros and Petra. If I go from rock to, from stone to rock, that's a very different word, but the audience would understand it means the same thing. I'm referring to the same guy. I'm not referring to something other than Dr. Stone, who was the subject under discussion. And in the same way, Peter is the subject under discussion in this passage. So there are, there are multiple reasons why I don't think that the, your first argument is particularly persuasive. When it comes to your second argument about Matthew's depiction of, of, uh, of, of Peter, um, well, all of the Gospels depict the disciples as slow on the uptake and as making mistakes. And I think it is misleading to single Peter out in this regard, because they all, and especially in Mark's account, they all are clueless at times. But Jesus also sees something in them, and they do things right. And that's included in Matthew's case. And I mean, you mentioned, for example, Matthew falls into the, into the water when he tries walking on it. Yeah, but he was the one that got out of the boat. He took the initiative and said, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And he did. And then Peter had a failing. But he initially did something right. And you look at these different Petrine passages, and Peter regularly does something right, and then he does something that's not as good. So Matthew does not present us with a uniformly negative portrait of Peter. He presents us with a mixed portrait of Peter, just like the others go other Gospels do. And, of course, as you know, the standard way that scholars have looked at this is, well, the Gospels, the, the Apostles were um, not fully understanding Jesus and not fully on board with his program, and uh, they were much weaker than they were pre-Pentecost, then after Pentecost, God's grace transformed them and made them what they needed to be. And so, sure, Peter is mixed, particularly in his performance before the uh, before Pentecost, but afterwards, he is a lion. I mean, he is the principal subject of the first 12 chapters of Acts. It is Peter, 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 right and left, with barely any mention of the others. And so he definitely became the rock that he needed to be. In terms of your third argument, destroy this so temple. Before before you go into it, can I respond to some of the points that you've made yet? Because I will forget everything that you say and if you go over every argument in, in, in order. So let yeah, me I let was, me respond. Go ahead. I was Cameron, gonna sorry. suggest that Jimmy that Jimmy respond to all of them just because I think that you responded to his in your opening statement. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm kind of torn here. I'd, I, I want to let Jimmy continue, but I also, Stephen, I don't want you to forget what he what he's saying. So why don't we why don't we do like you just suggested, Stephen? Why don't we go ahead and pause here and then go through some of the things that that Jimmy said? Sure, right, because you, otherwise your, your arguments. Yeah, we've we, your arguments. We've got and I can pull them back up. But for for the things that Jimmy just said and I'll stop talking. Go ahead. Yeah, because I will not be able to remember everything that Jimmy says. I can't listen to him and also take notes at the same time. I have to do one or the other. Um, so the first thing I would say, Jimmy, is that with respect to Petros and Petra, I think you have to make a choice whether you think Petros and Petra mean the same thing here or they don't. Uh, because I, I can agree with you in the abstract. Just take these words in the abstract and there's a way to make them uh, you know, mean that Peter is the rock. But you cannot be, I think, so open about whether Petros and Petra mean the same thing. If they do mean the same thing, then you have Peter, you have Jesus unnecessarily, or rather Matthew, unnecessarily using two different words and introducing an ambiguity that doesn't have to be there. He could very easily have just used Petros twice. On the other hand, if you and don't agree, I, that I, I provided two 
possible explanations. Assume, I, there are multiple reasons that that could be the case that don't necessitate Jesus being the rock. That's my point. So I, w- I was going to address that. So on the one hand, if, mm-hmm. you, if you agree that Petros and Petra mean the same thing, you have Matthew doing something unnecessarily complicated and using different words. Um, on the well, other hand, okay, if you that's, think that No, no, Petros... no, 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 no. I, you're reasserting your claim. I understand that that's your claim, but I then said, here are two s- synthetic parallelism and synonym use that would explain that. I, I was going to get to that. Um, okay. So... Again, this is why I wanted to to respond mm-hmm. before I heard all the arguments because I, I can't keep track of everything that is that is said um, and and not forget anything. Um, I don't if you if you grant that Petros and Petra mean different things. So if you take that possibility, then I agree that in principle you can make a reading like you were saying. You seem like a small rock, but actually you're a big stone and not whatever. But Jesus doesn't use any of those words. He doesn't say you seem small, but actually you're a great large rock. He says sue petros kai epitaute te petra. He uses th- that's exactly what he says. And given the fact that the words mean two different things on this hypothetical assumption, and given the fact that he uh, he doesn't use these fur- this further language that you mention. It seems very natural to interpret him as referring to different things. Petros is one thing, Petra is another. So the, I'm, I'm not going to deny that in the abstract, Jesus could have meant something like what you mean, but language is ambiguous and removed from any context, any, it can mean anything. Uh, it seems to me that if you, you, you have to kind of choose one way or the other, either you're going to accept that Petros and Petra mean the same thing or they don't. And in both cases, it seems to me strained to say that Peter can still be the rock on which the church is being built. Did you want to address my response to your second argument? Yes. The second argument that I would make is that you you are not really, I think, dealing with the stronger point, which is that the depiction of Simon in Matthew's gospel becomes more negative as time comes on. And the last time that Peter is mentioned by name is after denying Christ and weeping bitterly. Now, if that's the last thing that you ever mentioned about the rock on which the church is built in your gospel, it seems to me that either you've left this narrative, you know, loose end entirely untied, or else maybe it's not him that's the rock. And the 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 negative depiction of of Simon in the gospel is intended precisely to militate against the idea of basing the church on any of the apostles. I agree with you that the the depiction of the apostles in the New Testament is is sometimes blundering and not very positive, but that's because none of them are the rock. Christ alone is the rock, and they are fallible human beings like the rest of us, and they only have strength in Christ. Okay, so with respect to your first response, I I disagree that I need to, uh, to pick whether they mean the same thing or not. My point is, whether Petras and Petra mean the same thing or not, my argument still works. So I disagree that I need to pick. I have a personal opinion about which option is more likely, but it works either way. In regard to uh, your response to my response to your second argument, we're now appealing, we're now using an argument from silence based on remote context. It's an argument from silence because you note Peter vanishes from the narrative, at least he's not mentioned explicitly. We know he's really there when it talks about the eleven. Um, but he's it, the fact his name disappears after a certain point in the narrative, and it's very late in the narrative. We're dealing with an argument from silence based on remote context, and that's extraordinarily weak in terms of exegetical value. I would point out that unless you are of 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 the same mind as modern um, liberal exegetes, who will say if someone doesn't mention something, they don't know about it. Like people who will say, ooh, Paul never explicitly mentions the virgin birth, therefore Paul knows nothing about the virgin birth. Unless you're of that mindset, then you're going to have to assume that Matthew had common knowledge of that was around in the Christian community, including the prominence of Peter and what he went on to do after the uh, resurrection. You would have to assume, especially if you think Matthew wrote Matthew, that um, he knew about what Peter was doing in the first half of Acts, where he absolutely dominates the text, because Matthew would have been an eyewitness of Peter doing all those things. Even if you think someone other than Matthew wrote Matthew, presumably he's well-educated enough to know what's common knowledge in the Christian community as illustrated by the book of Acts. So I think that the... So Matthew would have known and if I think he was the third gospel to be written, would have expected others to know 
what Peter went on to do. Now, to your third argument um, about uh, destroy this temple. Well, it's true that in John chapter 2, uh, Jesus does say destroy this temple, and he is cryptically referring to his uh, to his own body there. Um, I think there's also a double reference because the temple did get destroyed, but and he predicted that in the synoptics. But leaving that aside, he does cryptically refer to his own body as this temple, and and as you acknowledged, any reasonable person. In fact, those were the words you used. Not any, every. Every reasonable person would understand, those were your exact words, that he was referring to the physical temple instead of his body because of the context. So um, I would make a couple points here. The first one is that, again, we have an appeal based on an implication that is found in a remote context. And this one is even more remote than the end of Matthew. This is a completely different gospel. So you're going to a completely different gospel. It's a very remote context to try to pull in something that would um, change the meaning of what we find in Matthew 16 and change it very counterintuitively, because ordinarily in Greek grammar, like in English grammar, you use a pronoun like this. It refers to the immediately preceding noun, or at least the immediately preceding feasible noun. And so since he says this rock, the natural implication would be that he's referring to the rock he just mentioned, you are Peter. And I think based on that um, principle, you would, I would hope, agree that every reasonable person would understand that when he says this rock, after having just said you are Peter, the reasonable interpretation is he's referring to Peter. And it requires, to my mind, more than an inference based on a completely different gospel with a single passage to say, well, no, he's really here secretly referring to himself. Maybe he's pointing to himself to say this rock or something, as, as some have proposed. So that would be my response to your third argument. Would you care to respond to that? Yeah, I don't think that, um, I don't think that you've quite understood what I was trying to say with the argument. So I don't mean to take this as an argument in favor of reading Jesus as the rock. I mean this more as a counter to the idea that it would be very strange and somehow inappropriate for Jesus suddenly to change the topic. So my, my it, it's not a positive argument in favor of my thesis. It's more of a defense against the apparent strangeness of my thesis. Um, oh, I, I, I say, took it since since the, since these were titled Five Reasons for Thinking Jesus is the Petra, I took it as a positive argument, but okay. So the slide is one thing, but what I said in my presentation mm -hmm. was another. Um, I, I do think, however, that the case is not as strong as you're making it because Jesus, once more, does not say sue Petros kai epi tuto to Petro. He doesn't say that. He says sue Petros kai epi taute te Petra. He uses different words. Right. So, so I don't even agree that it's natural for you to take him to be referring to the same thing. Okay, we're back to the first argument then. Anything else you want to say about my response to your third? Well, I would say this: these would be the two points that I would make. It's it's not okay. a positive argument on its own. It's rather a response to the po possible objection that this would be it would be unnatural for Jesus to speak that way. And the second point that I would make is that it is not at all obvious that Jesus is referring to Petros because he doesn't use the same word. So if you, I, you know, for example, when you gave that example, Mr. Stone and on this rock or whatever. It, I, it does not sound natural to me at all to hear you refer first place to Dr. Stone and then on this rock. To my mind, the most natural reading is that when you say rock, you're referring to somebody else or to something else. Um, and it does okay. not seem natural to me at all for you to say uh, you, Dr. Stone, are, you know, you are Dr. Stone and on this rock. That doesn't sound natural to me at all. Well, it may or may not sound natural, but I think most people in, at, at the award dinner we're, we're envisioning would pick up on my meaning. Um, to your fourth argument, uh, you alluded to the rest of the New Testament. And again, this is very remote context. We're way outside of the immediate context. We're not dealing with the passage itself. Having said that, Peter is actually um, extremely prominent, both in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. He's clearly the de facto leader of the apostles. By the way, he's their regular spokesman. He regularly takes the initiative to speak on their behalf. Uh, he, as I mentioned, dominates the first 12 chapters of Acts um, before the story changes to start following Paul instead of following Peter. Um, now, you 
also, I believe it was in this part of your argument, you said that, well, he's he's not called the foundation anywhere else. Well, um, there are a couple of things I'd have to say about that. The first one is that's again an argument from silence. Um, it, you can you can make exactly that argument with just about anything you want that or at least I, with very many things because there are a lot of things that are mentioned only in one passage or in two passages or something like that. And if you then exclude those passages from consideration and say, well, I want this to be mentioned elsewhere before I'm convinced, well, you've just created an argument from silence that ignores the evidence that's right in front of you. For example, the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is mentioned only in Ma in two passages, in Matthew and in Luke. And um, it would be possible for people to say, as liberal scholars have, well, it's mentioned only in these two passages, and if this was really a serious tradition about where Jesus was born, it ought to be mentioned elsewhere. It ought to be in Mark. It ought to be in John. It ought to be in Paul, and it's not. And that's a weak argument from silence, and it's weak in particular because it excludes the very data that is under consideration. And so I don't find it persuasive to say that, well, yeah, maybe here in Matthew 16, it refers to Peter as the foundation, but it doesn't elsewhere, as if that were a decisive consideration in any sense, because it's excluding the data that is right before us. Now, when it comes to the New Testament's discussion of the foundation of the church, there are actually five texts that deal with this, and each text presents the foundation of the church differently. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3, Paul depicts the foundation of the church as Christ and nothing but Christ. If you look at 1 Peter 2, Peter depicts Christ as part of the foundation of the church, namely as the cornerstone. But a cornerstone is only part of a foundation, so he's depicting Christ as part of the foundation, but not the whole thing. If you look in Ephesians 2, Paul depicts, the, and this is the same Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians 3, if you look in Ephesians 2, he presents Christ as the cornerstone with the New Testament apostles and New Testament prophets as the rest of the foundation. If you look in Revelation 21, you find that the heavenly city, has, which represents the church, has 12 foundations, which are the 12 apostles, no mention of Jesus. And then in Matthew 16, you find that the foundation of the church is depicted as one of the apostles in particular, namely Peter. And so you don't have a consistent depiction of the foundation of the church. What you have is five different passages that use similar metaphors, but they can't be understood, in, any one of them cannot be understood as exclusive. You have to read all of them in harmony with each other, and yes, in one sense, Christ is the unique foundation. In another sense, it's Christ and the apostles. In another sense, it's the twelve apostles. And in one sense, it's Peter. So you can't use these other foundational passages to dominate Matthew 16. It needs to be read and given its due, just like these other passages do. That's my response to your fourth argument. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I would say that I'm not making an argument from silence because uh, the, well, at least if I am making an argument from silence, it's not one that is uh, inappropriate for the following reason. Such a topic as the founding of the church uh, on a particular apostle is important enough that you would expect it to be corroborated or at least to come up in context in which this sort of thing is at question. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, we don't find that. Um, furthermore, I would say actually you find a lot of confirmation for Peter being extremely prominent as a leader in the church, and that serves as confirmation of this foundational role. No, because it's one thing to be prominent and to be a leader in a group, and it's another thing to have the kind of role that your reading is attributing to Peter. Because, for example, in a circle of friends, you may have one person whose personality is more dominant and he acts as the kind of glue. Maybe he acts on behalf of the friend group and so on because that's just his personality. It doesn't follow that he has any sort of office or position, official ranking within the group that corresponds to that. And it seems to me that everything that happens within Acts in the first 12 chapters is perfectly consonant with Peter having a certain sort of personality and taking the lead without himself being anything as lofty as the rock on which the church is built. 
So it sounds to me like your argument is that we have no evidence of Peter being given an office except for the fact that here Peter is given an office. So we need to exclude that fact and use the silent perceived silence elsewhere to determine the meaning of the passage. If I would also I say, do... I would also say, by the, by the way, I would also say, actually, we do have in uh, both Luke and John passages in which Peter is given a unique office among the apostles that is not given to the other apostles. Actually, three of the four synoptic gospels contain a passage that explicitly gives Peter a unique office among the apostles. I haven't gone into that because it would take us, you know, our subject tonight is the rock, but I would note that the actually this isn't the only place, even in the gospels, where Peter is given a unique office. It's actually in three of the four. I don't agree with your interpretation of those other passages. I think that those passages in Luke and John are overinterpreted. Um, if they mean anything other than Jesus telling Peter, hey, when things turn around, you need to be a source of comfort and exhortation for your brethren. That doesn't mean anything about an office. Anybody can do that who has the gospel. Well, actually, and I also don't agree in, with you that actually, this passage in, involves in Luke, Peter being given an office. I don't think that's in the passage in, at all. In Luke 22, Jesus is explicitly answering the question, who is the greatest among the apostles? It's it, So that indicates he has a unique role because he points to Peter as being the greatest. Um, so uh, anything else on my response to your fourth argument? It seems to me once more that you are taking for granted your interpretation of this passage. I've offered you an alternative reading of this passage, mm -hmm. which involves Peter not being given an office at all and involves nothing special about Peter in particular or to the exclusion of anybody else who is a Christian. So I, I don't agree with you that I'm offering an argument from silence. Here we have one passage and plausibly it's read one way, but that doesn't appear anywhere else. So therefore we have to reject. I don't even agree with you that your pa this passage is plausibly read in your way at all. So it's, it's not just a matter of me offering an argument from silence. It's me offering an alternative interpretation of a passage, which is grammatically, I think, just as possible, if not more possible, and furthermore, more consonant than the alternative with Matthew's gospel and with the rest of the New Testament. So I don't agree with your characterization of the of the situation so far. Okay. Um, I'm going to touch rather lightly on, uh, because I, I know that uh, Cameron's going to want to move on soon, but I'm going to touch rather lightly on your fifth argument, and then I want to touch on your chiastic structure of the passage. Um, regarding the uh, argument that, well, Jesus elsewhere is said to conquer Hades. Um, you know, the language isn't exactly that in these other passages, um, but uh, certainly Jesus does come back from the dead. However, the phrase, now, the phrase gates of Hades is the standard Hebrew word that is the equivalent of Hades is Sheol, which referred to the place of the dead, just like Hades does. And in fact, Isaiah refers to, um, refers to the gates of Sheol, which gets translated in the, well, I'd have to check in the Septuagint, but he refers to the gates of Sheol as the place where dead people are going. And so it seems fairly straightforward when Jesus says, as you pointed out, the normally in a statement like, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, the it would refer to the preceding relevant noun, which would normally be taken to be the church. It makes perfectly straightforward sense to say, well, the church will never die. The church will never go to the place of the dead. It will never be imprisoned within the gates of Hades. It'll never be imprisoned within death. And so I take that as a very straightforward way of saying the church is just never going to die. And that doesn't require us, to, there, given that that's the straightforward and expected reading, given the pronoun placement, it would be unnatural to say, oh, no, it's really referring to this much earlier thing about Jesus, and Jesus is going to come back from the dead. That's, yeah, it's true, Jesus comes back from the dead, but it's perfectly natural to read this as the church is just never going to die. Finally, in regard to your uh, chiastic structure, I agree with you that we do have a chiastic structure here, and for me, the middle part of it is the whole statement about Peter, that sentence, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, Cam, if you're able, could you put up, um, could you put up Stephen's second slide with the chiastic structure? 
Yeah, and I'll put it up on this scene so we don't have to switch scenes. So just uh, okay. give me a second to, to pull it up here. There we go. So, um, so in order to get the center point of this to be just the Petra, uh, what Stephen has had to do is break a sentence in two. He, we have the first sentence, which is verse 17, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, blah, blah, blah beginning of the second sentence, and I tell you, you are Peter. And then he's got to break it off at that point and go to, and on this Petra, meaning I myself, which he doesn't actually say, I will build my church. And then he gives us uh, the, he has to break another sentence into, which is with the B prime part, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then he's got to break that sentence into and give us the A prime part and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and so forth. So in order to get this structure, in order to isolate the Petra away from Peter, because the rest of it's clearly all about Peter, in order to isolate the Petra from Peter, he has to break the he has to break two sentences in half in order to get this structure. Uh, Cam, could you put up uh, my any one of my slides, preferably the last? Sure. Here we go. Okay. So in my in mine, I'm keeping the statements together. The two part explanation clearly follows on the initial blessing to Peter in each of the three statements. Flesh and, the flesh and blood part explains, blessed are you, what you bind is clearly part of what it means to have the keys, and on this rock is clearly part of what it means to be Peter. So I think my chiastic structure better reflects the, uh, the actual literary form of the text, and I don't have to break sentences in weird ways in order to isolate the, the rock of the church from Peter. Thank you. So I, I would like briefly to respond to this point about the chiasm. Um, uh -huh. I, I would note that it is not strange to break up the chiasm in the way that I did, because actually you have a certain structure. So if, you, if you'll if you open up the, the slide, please, uh, Cameron. In my interpretation of the chiastic structure, basically you have two verbs, a verb, two verbs, a verb, two verbs. So you have, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in the heavens, that's two verbs. The second one, you are Petros, that's one verb. On this Petra, I will build my church, that's a verb, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, that's another two verbs. Then you have a single verb, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that's one verb, and then whatever you bind on earth will have been bound, and so on. So you have a... You have two verbs, one verb, two verbs, one verb, two verbs. So there is a logical way of breaking up the chiasm here. I will note, however, that with your chiasm, you have basically the the sentences broken up after a after a um, after a conjunction. Uh, so if you would open up, please, his slide with his uh, reading. Um, so if if you'll see here, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So there. In, uh, in almost every case, you've broken up the sentence where there is a, um, you've broken up the parts of the sentence where there is a conjunction. Um, and so mm -hmm. that that's, yep. you have a similar grammatical structure here, but it's and not as if and these are totally. And that's, why, and that's why we have conjunctions, is to join different meaning units together into sentences. I agree with you. However, there is a certain point here. So in C1, you do not have a conjunction breaking off the next part of C1. So the pattern of breaking with a conjunction is falls apart there. Now, I don't think that this is a very strong point because strictly speaking, what makes a chiasm is not the conjunctions or the verbs and all that. It's the what's being talked about. It's the, the actual topic. Uh, so you can still have a chiasm even if you don't have exactly the same grammatical structure in both cases. But I will note that I have this pattern in my reinterpretation of the chiasm. You have two verbs, one verb, two verbs, one verb, two verbs. Uh, and your breaking a part of the passage is for every conjunction, except at the beginning of chapter nine uh, at verse 19, because you don't have a conjunction there. You have a verb breaking off the next part of the, uh, of the, of the, the structure. Yeah, mine is semantic, meaning it's based on meaning units. And I think that the meaning units are much more obvious to a reader of Matthew's Gospel than counting how many verbs are present in a particular 
uh, run of text. So I would I would say that I think mine is the more obvious in a literal sense. It's the more obvious structure of this text. Whether it's obvious depends on how you interpret the name Petros. Again, if you if you take Petros as meaning of the rock, like I did, like Augustine does, uh, and if you see in the dif the differentiated usage of Petros and Petra, mm -hmm. a difference of reference, then it does not seem to me at all obvious that your way of breaking apart the text is the right way. Yeah, I would disagree there because remember, I started, I mean, when I started studying this text, I was of the opinion that Peter is not the rock and that the Petra is something different than Peter is. Um, so I didn't do this as an ad hoc move to make this fit Peter being the rock. I came at it from the other perspective. I came at it saying Peter is not the rock. And this, this set of structures was so obvious to me that I had to change my view. And See, I think my you view, were by right the way, the and my, and my, wrong my, later. my, so you my go view, back to your by the way, opinion. my view, by the way, is that is one that is shared by numerous Protestant scholars. Um, now, I don't say that to as if that's proof of anything, because, of course, it's not. But I think just as you noted that various church fathers have various interpretations of this, in addition to Peter being the rock, loads of very qualified Protestant scholars, D.A. Carson, F.F. F. Bruce, tons of others, uh, R.T. France, um, agree that, yeah, Peter is the rock. They then try to build a firewall uh, to say, well, yeah, but uh, th that doesn't mean there are later popes. And that's a separate issue that has to be talked about. But in terms of is Peter the rock, that is broadly agreed to in Protestant scholarship as well as Catholic and Orthodox scholarship. I agree. But let's I think give it's let's give Stephen the, the final word. Arguments. Mm -hmm. I was going to so, let Stephen give the, ahead, the final word here. Yeah, I was, I was going to let you give the final word and then we'll switch over to do some Q&A. How's that sound? Sounds great. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that uh, you can tell there's a reason why some commentators call this the most controversial passage in the New Testament, because there are so many things to talk about. Uh, and there are so many different ways of attacking the text uh, that it, it's very hard to come to a, a firm conclusion. Now, like I was saying to you, Jimmy, I think you had the right idea when you first started reading this passage and you went down the wrong direction. So I, I think you should go back to your initial idea about Peter being something other than the rock. Uh, and I think one, I, again, I think that this is a very good argument. Um, the, the fact is that Jesus doesn't use the same word twice, even though he easily could have, even though all the commentators grant that he easily, Matthew easily could have had Jesus say, sue Petros kai epitutoto Petro, using the same word twice. He could have done that, but he doesn't. He says, sue Petros kai epitaute te Petra. Already he uses two words. It already suggests a difference of referent, um, and it makes Jesus's discourse needlessly complicated. Um, and then when you consider the fact that the last time Matthew mentions Peter is in his denial of Christ. And then after that, he sort of disappears into the crowd. Now, if I mention something in the middle of one of my papers, for example, when I was in school, uh, if I mention something in the middle of one of my papers that was really important, and then it just be, and then the ending of my paper either doesn't pick up that point at all, or else I go in the entirely opposite direction and I don't resolve the tension, you might think I were a bad writer. Um, because when you bring up a point like this, and if the idea is precisely that Peter is the rock on which the church is built, you would not expect the last thing that Matthew says to be that Jesus, that Peter denies Jesus and goes away and cries bitterly. This is why some scholars even think that Matthew thought that Peter was an apostate and a false disciple, because he does exactly what Christ says, whoever denies me before men. Um, but again, all this, that the idea that Peter is the rock on which the church is built, turns Matthew into this anti-Petrine polemic, which is unnecessary. It's much more consonant, like I say, I think, to read um, the rock as Jesus. And Peter is, Simon is Petros because he is of the rock. He is of the Petra. Um, now, at this point, I'm just repeating my arguments, and I, I think it will be good to answer some questions from the audience. But I, I very much have enjoyed the discussion. I, I very much have enjoyed the discussion from Jimmy also. I thought there was a, some great back and forth, and I appreciated the points that he raised. So I, I, I want to thank both of you for having me on and for agreeing to do the, the chat with me. Thank you. And I, uh, I just want to chime in and agree with uh, Stephen there that it's been a, a, thus far, it's been a great discussion and we've had a lot of really good exchanges. And I also want to thank Cameron for, for having us both on.
Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to some questions now. So uh, my formatting's all off here. So from Cranman Photo Cinema, he says, and he actually has sent in a few questions. So we'll we'll get through all of his uh, actually at first here. So he says, Jimmy, if Matt 16 is so obviously about Peter, then how do you explain all the different views of the ECFs? You'll have to explain what that is. Doesn't early seem that obvious. Fathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, early well, I think the early fathers. church fathers have different views because they are um, they have a polyvalent view of scripture. That means that you have a single um, you have a single text that has multiple layers of meaning, and they're referring to different things. This is something I find in um, in listening to Protestant discussions of this passage, where uh, Protestants will propose like, okay, maybe it's Peter in the sense that he um, is confessing Christ. Well, yeah, I can agree. That's a sense that that you can you can get out of this. There are, I guess, this is a mode of thought that frequently is not really fully appreciated because it's not typically used in the Protestant community. It's much more used in Catholic and Orthodox circles, where you agree that a text can have multiple different readings, it can have multiple different applications, and they're not in conflict with each other. So I think that's what the early Church Fathers are doing, is they're exploring the different range of things that you can do with this text. The tendency among the early Church Fathers to do that got so extreme that you eventually had certain voices saying, okay, look, you can see all these different meanings in the text, but you need to figure out what's the literal meaning, what's the primary thing that the sacred author is intending to communicate. And the literal sense is the foundation for all of these other meanings and applications. And so I don't, I don't mind people, include, whether they're church fathers or modern people or devotional writers, I don't mind them doing all kinds of things with this text. But I think that if you are asking the question, who is the rock in the literal sense that Matthew was intending to communicate, it is very, very clearly Peter. And that's why I think you have broad agreement to that fact among the church fathers and among Protestant scholars today. All right. So Cranman, hey, he's got a, like I said, he's got a few questions, so we'll get through all of his. He says, Jimmy, if Peter leads, then why do we see almost all doctrine established for several hundred years through councils with hardly a peep from the Pope? Because it is generally better not to, it is generally better to build a consensus. If you want to go, get people to adopt a particular position, you want to bring as many supporting voices in as possible. And we actually see that happening in the book of Acts, because God has already made it clear you don't need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. That's very clear from uh, Acts chapter 10 onward. But later, it still came up as a controversy, and so they then held the Acts 15 council, so it wouldn't just be Peter and Paul and Barnabas saying, yeah, you can be a Christian without being circumcised. They wanted to bring the important, respected voices of the Jewish community together, including James in particular, but also others, because it says it was the apostles and elders that made this decision. And uh, at the Acts 15 Council, you have Peter saying, you very well know that a while back God made a distinction between me and you, that the Gentiles would come into the church. So this had already been settled through the Pope, but it was still helpful to deal with the controversy to hold a council to deal with it. All right, so the last question from John, that's his real name, says, Jimmy, if Peter has the keys to bind and loose over and above the other apostles, then why do we see Paul writing the bulk of New Testament doctrine? Because the authority to exercise governance of the church has nothing to do with the literary output of a particular person. St. Thomas Aquinas would have recognized that the Pope was the Pope and had more authority than he did, but nevertheless, St. Thomas Aquinas was a prolific author who cranked out stuff. So I would say that um, the fact someone has authority to govern the church doesn't mean, doesn't tell us anything about what their literary output is going to be. And then we had a, a really nice comment from Joshua Backrads. I don't know how to say this. He says, love you, Stephen. Amazingly smart. Just a very nice comment. Stephen is pretty smart. I'll give him that. Kind of smart. All right. A goy for Jesus. He says, if the Petrine office in the New Testament is about evangelizing Jews, apostle to the circumcision, wouldn't the papal office's views 
about never doing that mitigate against the reality of an ongoing office? So I suppose that's for, to, yeah, for I was, was going to say, I, I okay. suppose that's for you. And then Stephen, if you've got any comments, feel free to well, share. Pope's, Popes can make mistakes, and uh, and actually the Pope has not said don't evangelize Jews. Um, the there are, there are sensitivities in light of the Holocaust about how that needs to be done, but um, even if you had the Pope today saying never evangelize Jews, that would just mean he's wrong. Um, that wouldn't mean he's not he's not the Pope. He's not the successor of Peter because Peter did things that were wrong. But that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't give him an office. All of the apostles received offices from Jesus, and all of the apostles still made mistakes. So you would expect the um, uh, later popes to certainly do the same as well. Any comments, Stephen? I don't have very many comments. Um, I do think that this objection is, uh, you can respond to it, you can meet it. Um, I will note this. I do think that the conception of papal infallibility in Roman Catholicism is very precisely defined uh, to the extent that it's very difficult, nearly impossible to falsify. Um, and I think that that's actually... Um, it, it's disappointing you know, you for those who would a, like to falsify it. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, 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 it can be considered, I suppose. Maybe you could in principle consider this a point against it. Um, basically, the idea is that the Pope is only guaranteed to be right in very specific and highly specified circumstances, and he can be the Pope and carry all the authorities of the Pope with the necessary qualifications made, even though he doesn't resemble anything like what a Pope should be. Um, so it's, it's not so much that the Pope as a person is very particularly important or whatever, it's the office of the Pope that is more important, and only in particular circumstances is the particular is there sort of a total overlap between the office and the person? When a pope, for example, speaks ex cathedra and defines some matter of faith and morals, then there is a total overlap between person and office so that you have to obey what he's taught. But if he's not speaking in those circumstances, if he's just being himself, then even though he's the pope, he may not live up to the expectations or the the, the sort of the, the dignity of the office. He can be wrong about things. Maybe it can even be right to disobey him in certain circumstances, as long as once more he's not speaking in those very precisely defined uh, circumstances. And I would agree. Um, I think that's a that's a very nice statement of the situation. And it's essentially what we see in the New Testament with Peter. Um, you know, he's not infallible when he's making dinner arrangements in Antioch. And or most of the time, Peter is not infallible, but he is infallible when he writes first and second Peter, his two inspired encyclicals. Whoops, pulled up the wrong scene here. No, I did. I got the right one. <laughs> okay, uh, here's the next question from the other Paul. He says, uh, the question for Jimmy, for your case today, you adopted a Protestant method of looking at the text and not minding patristic opinion. Will you consistently apply this in other scriptural debates against Protestants? Well, I, 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 I didn't exclude patristic opinion. Um, I think that in order to... Um, in order to interpret a text, we have to deal with the text first on its own terms. And to the extent needed, we can then pull in additional information. Now, in interpreting a scriptural text, um, it needs to not contradict other things, I know as a Catholic, but this isn't. Um, the, the, the meaning of Peter being the rock does not contradict other things. And so I don't need to go to the church fathers and they're mixed anyway. So for purposes of a discussion like this, you know, nose counting the fathers and saying who has many more meanings of what, and did this particular father hold this view or that view or what combination of views, it would muddy the, muddy the waters. So I, I did what I did was simply stick with, let's take the text on its own terms first. We don't need to go to these other considerations because if you take the text on its own terms, it shows Peter's the rock. And, uh, and so I've established what I need to establish. Any thoughts on that, Stephen? No? Okay. All right, so here's the uh, last super chat that was sent in. Thank you guys for sending these in. So uh, writer John Buck, if the early, and this is a little bit off topic, if the early Christians only took a performative understanding of Christ's presence in the Eucharist, 
like Zwingli, then shouldn't we see a debate at some point between the realists and the Zwingliists? And why don't we have Stephen yeah. chime in here on this one? Well, I am a Zwinglian about the Eucharist, and I certainly would be interested in having a chat with somebody about this topic. Um, I wrote a book on the topic. It's currently under review for publication. I don't know whether it will get published, but it's it's under review. So uh, I would certainly be open to talking to somebody. I noticed that there is recently, uh, especially among Protestants, a trend in the direction of the doctrine of the real presence. Um, but I for various reasons, I think that that's the, the wrong way to go. I think that Zwingli is right about this. Um, so I would certainly myself be open to a chat about it with somebody. And I was uh, similarly of a Zwinglian persuasion when I was an evangelical, but uh, I would expect that there would be a debate in the early church fathers because there were clearly realists among the early church fathers when it comes to the Eucharistic presence. And if the original position had been Zwinglian, I would have expected a debate that didn't occur. And that's one of the things that led me to become a realist on the Eucharistic presence. All right. So uh, we've got just a couple more questions actually pulled up here. So if you guys have any more questions, I mean, we're, we're, we'll go for about another 20 minutes, but if you have a question for either speaker today, then just leave it in the live chat. I'll keep an eye on it. So uh, here's the next, actually, so let me do this first. There was a, I, I posted a really nice comment about Steven. Let me post a really nice one about Jimmy here. Jimmy Aiken is a cyborg that God has sent from the future to save the church. Trent Horn. <laughs> Well, I voice. always have to give the Glomar response to that. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was funny. And then the way that this title, the the stream, uh, the the title of this video is "Who is the Rock?" And I should have like seen the connection there. <laughs> the Rock is Dwayne Johnson. There, Salt there you Florida. go. Yeah, we can yeah, all agree. There on were that. about a hundred comments like that. <laughs> I know, and I I missed it. I completely missed it. Like, and I I'm the one that set it up. So I don't know it. if you saw this, Cameron, but there are a lot of people in the chat saying that the stream was freezing or that it was uh, getting blocked up and, and unfreezing and so on. Is that do you know anything about that? Can you do anything about that? It's it's just on your video, it looks like. That's what that's the only thing that I've noticed. So I haven't noticed any other choppiness or anything else. So I've I've only noticed a little bit of it. So yeah, I don't yeah, think Yeah, and I'm noticing issue. that the Jimmy's camera and my camera are still working while yours is frozen. So that leads me I to think that, that it's a probably couple times. I did see that a and, couple times that my camera would freeze. And we could still hear you though. So you were still getting your points across even when it did freeze. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yep. Yep. All right. So here's the next question from Sarah Luke. He or she says, question for both. I think this is Aiken, appealed to the literary device Chiasmus to make argument. However, Stephen gave a counter argument on John 2. How do you respond to Stephen? I'm not sure I understand the question. So I think I think the idea was this. Your argument was that because uh, chap verse 17, verse 18, and verse 19 begin with a statement about Peter, uh, therefore verses, uh, verse 18 parts B and C have to be about Peter too, uh, and that it would be a strange change of subject for him to start, for Jesus to start talking about himself. Um, whereas I, my counter argument was no, there is a chiasm here. So the middle part does not have to be about the same thing as the other parts. And a parallel to this change of topic was the passage from John two. I think that's what he's referring to. Okay. Well, I would agree there is a chiasmus here, but, um, we have per perceived the chiasmus differently. And I would agree that in principle, if you have a, that the center point of a chiasmus could be on a different subject than, than the elements surrounding it. However, when you have all of the elements surrounding it being Peter, it is less likely that even granting your chiasma structure, Stephen, um, when all of the surrounding context is about Peter, it's unnatural to expect a shift of topic on that little evidence in the center point. Um, I also disagree that that's the center point. And um, so that would be my basic response is I simply see the chiasmus as being structured differently around units instead of counting individual verbs. I think it's about basic units of meaning and that are where you have essentially three statements of three elements each. 
So Stephen, uh, to your point, I did see someone say in the live chat that the, the whole stream was frozen. So apologies about that, guys. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's on YouTube's end or my end. Uh, fortunately, I'm recording everything locally. So if the stream is actually like messed up on YouTube, everything is recorded locally. I can just upload the video. And we did address all of the super chats that came in. So just wanted Cameron to let Bert you guys know. Cameron Bertuzzi for the win. Good job on that local recording. Yeah, I, I do that with every recording. I've got to make sure that uh, mm -hmm. I've got backups to everything. So, all right. So here's the uh, the last question that I've got for us today. It looks like from Born Again RN. Question, if this rock, Taute Petra, is the previous noun, Peter, not the previous subject, Peter's confession, why isn't a Taute Petra the previous noun, rebel, in Numbers 2010, but the rock in verse 8? Stephen, do you happen to remember Numbers 2010 off the top of your head? <laughs> no, I don't remember by the top. I'm, I mean, this is maybe there's a good question here, but I haven't read Numbers 20 in, in the last okay, couple of so, days, so I couldn't tell so you. You'd have to open it up. I, I, I just pulled it up. Here's what it says. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, here now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And so it does have the phrase, I'm looking at it in Hebrew, it does use the Hebrew for this rock, um, Zehasela. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. So let's see if we can relate to the question. First of all, I would note this is an extremely remote context. And so I don't think that Numbers 2010 is going to be uh, decisive for our understanding of Matthew 16. We would need a lot more in common with Matthew between Matthew 16 and Numbers 20 to make the passage highly relevant to the meaning of um, of um, of Matthew 16. But let's see if this rock is the previous noun, not the previous subject. Why isn't Taute Petra the previous noun rebel? Okay, so I understand the question now. So. Um, Let's read Numbers 20.10 again. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Okay, so the what we have going on here is the this. It's not simply the previous noun. Um, when I was addressing this issue, you if you go back and watch the playback, you should see me saying the previous relevant or possible noun or something like that. Um, you know, if I won't give a counter example for sake of time, but um, so here at the end of Numbers 2010, we have, shall we bring uh, forth water for you out of this rock? And that tells us that we should, the this tells us we should look for a previous reference to the same thing. And ordinarily, if nothing, you know nothing else, it would be the previous noun. But in this case, we know something more. It's a rock. So is that this rock tells us that we're talking about a rock. So you want to look for, you want to look back to not just the previous noun, but the previous reference to a rock. And we do find that when it says Moses and Aaron gathered the people before the rock. So in this case, actually, you bring out a very good point, point born again, Ari, and I meant to bring this up, but I don't know that I quite got it out. Um, the phrase, this rock in Matthew 16, tells us we're talking about a rock. So not only do we want to look to the previous noun, we want to look to the previous reference to a rock. And the previous reference to a rock is you are Peter. So not only does the um does it fit the previous noun rule it's also the previous thing under discussion the previous rock yes yeah, steven any thoughts here or should we move we, we did get one more question that was sent in we can keep going okay so here's the last one and i promise this is the last one now so from nick height he says question for both in this verse could jesus be commissioning the Peter's apostolic ministry, but not establishing the papacy. What are your thoughts? Let's start with Stephen. Okay. So I, I do agree that this is what's happening. I think, for example, that when Christ says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you shall bind, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that that's what he's doing. He is telling him, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And with these keys, you are going to open and shut, bind and loose in accordance with the will of heaven. Now, what are those keys? 
I do not think, uh, even though a lot of people see here a reference to Isaiah chapter 22, um, and they think that, you know, th there's that reference in Isaiah 22 to Shebna being replaced with Eliakim, and God is going to give Eliakim the key of the house of David, and he, what he opens, no one will shut, and what he shuts, no one will open. Um, a lot of people seem to think that because there, Shebna is being replaced with Eliakim as in his position of sort of second in command or a chief steward or whatever, that this is the parallel between the two passages. I think actually that the parallel is in the image of the keys, but not in the being placed in second of command. I think that when Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, uh, he is talking about he's going to be empowering Peter with something that will give him an authority to bind and to loose and will open up and which will open up the kingdom of heaven to people. And what is that? It's going to be the gospel of the risen Jesus that he is going to he, he's going to receive this commissioning at the end of the gospel when uh, when all the disciples are gathered at the mountain and he says, all authority has, has been given to me. Go, therefore, into all the nations and make uh, disciples of them, teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. That's when he receives the keys and the keys that he receives are the gospel of Christ and his teachings. And he opens, he binds and looses with in accordance with the will of heaven in the sense that unlike the Pharisees who bind or, bound or loosed whatever they wanted, Peter in preaching the gospel is going to bind what will have been bound in heaven and will, is going to loose what will have been loosed in heaven. So the keys therefore are the gospel that is given to Peter, but it's not given only to Peter. So his, he is being set up in an apostolic ministry. He's being set up to preach the gospel to people, but it is not unique to him. It's, it's not something that other people in principle could not possess. So that's how I would, uh, uh, interpret that passage. Jimmy? Okay. Um, can you put up the question again, just so I can make sure I'm answering it directly? Could Jesus be commissioning uh, the ap Peter's apostolic ministry, but not establishing the papacy? So let me address that first. Well, he could, but the, he could be, but the context in, doesn't indicate that. Let me explain what I mean. Um, the reason it, he's not just commissioning Peter's apostolic ministry is because Peter's already an apostle. Jesus chose the apostles in Matthew chapter 10 and gave them their commission at that point. So Peter's already an apostle. This is something over and above that. Now, uh, so this is some new office, and if you're told Jesus is founding his church on you, I think it's pretty straightforward to understand that as well. Once he ascends back to heaven, Peter's the one in charge. Um, and so I concluded when I first made my discoveries about the structure of this passage, that meant the Catholics were right about there is a pope. Peter was the pope. Now, I didn't know what are the parameters of that office, what abilities does that give him, or are there any future popes? I was still holding out the prospect of, you know, establishing a firewall between Peter and the later papacy. But I had to say Catholics are right. Jesus, Jesus made Peter the boss of the 12 apostles, and not just here, but Luke 22, where Jesus is answering the question of who is the greatest, and he ends up pointing to Peter after making a couple of preliminary points, and also uh, John 21, where he, is, um, where he establishes Peter in a shepherding role over the other disciples. Having said that, um, I concluded, okay, so Catholics are right. Jesus established the church with a pope. Now, are there future popes? Well, it's a separate question. I think that, like most scholars, I think there is a reference here to Isaiah 22 and the chief steward of the house of David that has a key with which he opens and shuts. And when you have that uh, key with binding and loosing, I think it's a very clear allusion to that passage, just like Protestant scholars like F.F. F. Bruce and others have pointed out. Um, and I think that, like F.F. Bruce said, Jesus is making um, Peter the chief steward of his new kingdom, just like J David had a chief steward who was over his household that we read about in, uh, in Isaiah 22. You've got David the king, and then you've got the chief steward under him. You've got Jesus as the new David and Peter as the new chief steward. Um, I, don't, I don't think that binding and loosing is a reference to the gospel, because otherwise Peter would have been given the liberty. He's, he's given the liberty. If binding means, I don't know what, preaching the gospel, then, then loosing would be withholding the gospel from people. And Peter's clearly not given that discretion to, oh, I'm going to evangelize some people and just totally ignore others. He's supposed to evangelize the world with the other apostles. 
Um, if you look at the Jewish context, this phrase, binding and loosing, was actually known and it was used in Jesus' own time. The Jewish historian Josephus, also a first century author, uses the term binding and loosing, and it refers to a governing authority, the ability to make, uh, to, pro to prohibit, that's binding, and to permit, that's loosing. And this is not just Josephus, it's also all over the Mishnah, which was written in the first and second centuries. And so this is an established phrase, which is why Jesus doesn't stop, or Matthew doesn't stop to define it, because people already knew this meant governing authority uh, and the ability to make or abolish rules. And so he's giving, he eventually gives all of the disciples, all of the 12, the ability to bind and loose, but he uniquely gives Peter the key. And if Jesus then established the church with a pope, and if he's alluding to a passage that actually deals with the tr transition of office from Shebna to Eliakim, as Stephen said, that's at least suggestive of this may be a successive office. But more fundamentally, if G nobody, very few people in the original Christian community at this stage were aware there was going to be a second generation. You know, Paul is expecting the second, in First Thessalonians, he's expecting the second coming within his own lifetime. It's only later that he realizes there's going to be a second generation of Christians. So at this stage, we certainly wouldn't expect any explicit discussion of, is there going to be another generation of Christians, and will there need to be another generation of the papacy? Because the whole continue, continuation of the church beyond the first generation had not yet been revealed. But if Jesus felt the church needed a papacy and established it as having a chief leader in his absence in its first generation, then we would naturally expect that to, to be continued in later generations. It wouldn't make sense for Jesus to say, you know, the church, when it's tiny, needs this single leader, but later on, when it's billions of people, it won't. The fact that he wanted unity in his church as he prayed on the night he was betrayed in John 17, for example, um, would point to the ongoing need for a papacy. Because if, if the leadership burdens in the apostolic community were great enough, you needed a single leader right then, you're still going to need a single leader as the church gets bigger because the administrative burdens and the complexity of managing the church is only going to grow. Cam, you're muted. Sorry about that. I muted my, anyways. Uh, no I, I was coming in to say we had a, a couple more super chats come in, but how are you guys doing on time? I'm, I'm fine. I'm free. Okay. So let's get to these uh, two super chats and then please guys don't send any more in so we can close out this episode from Cactoid Jim. It's actually a really good question. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, how you guys respond to this at both. Is there any reason to think that you're, uh, chaistic, how is it, how is it pronounced? Chiastic. Chiastic, chiastic structure is exclusively correct, uh, correct in exclusion <laughs> of your opponent's interpretation. It's late. Who do you want to go first? Let's have Steven because you just, you went for a while just now, Jim. Okay. Sounds good. So I would not put very much weight on the chiastic structure. It seems to me, um, how you interpret Petra whether you have the same referent as in Petras or not, it seems to me that's going to determine where the chiasm is. So it's not that there's a chiasm this way or there's a, it's depending on the interpretive decisions that you make about the referent of Petra, that is going to dictate the precise nature and the structure of the chiasm. But I don't think, I don't think the chiasm by itself is going to do very much or, or is going to do very much work. I would significantly agree with that. I don't think that, um, that I, th I think my articulation of the chiasm is, you know, superior. I think it's the one that would be the most obvious to someone, you know, looking at the units of meaning instead of counting verbs within the units of meaning. I think the obvious structure is is the obvious one. Um, but I, I think that the natural way to read this is ultimately not about whether there's a chiasm here or not. Um, I think it's, you look at this, we've got a context of blessings on Peter, and you've got then these elaborations of the initial three statements. We've got three blessings on Peter, each of which gets a two-part elaboration. 
all of that points to Peter being the rock, whether this was structured chiastically or not. All right. That was uh, shorter than I was expecting. So here's from Joshua, uh, another one from Backrads, Backrads. For Stephen, why do you think that critical scholars like Ehrman and Price take the opposite view to yours? Much love. Well, I would say that uh, people like Bart Ehrman and Robert Price are already wrong about so many things that they have an inclination <laughs> towards falsehood. So they would probably take this reading too. It's just a part of the general <laughs> inclination towards falsehood that exists in them. And so this is just a further manifestation of it. I don't know. I mean, people can, you know, it's, it's not like there are no reasons to take an alternative view. Jimmy just gave us a very nice presentation and he gave, he showed, listen, this is one way that you can think about things. Even if I disagree with Jimmy at the end of the day, I don't think that the alternative reading is totally impossible. I, I, I can see why a person would think that. Um, it's just that I, I don't think that actually those, those, that, that case is, um, uh, you know, perfectly convincing at the end of the day. I think that other, uh, another perspective is more convincing personally, but why do they take that way? I mean, I don't know. It, it's the, the facetious answer is that they're already disposed towards falsehood. So this would just be a further manifestation of that. The serious answer is that there are a lot of reasons to think a lot of things and everybody, you know, the average person has some reasons, whether they can explicitly formulate them or not. The average person has some reasons at their, dis at their disposal for the things that they believe. So it's not surprising to me that there are going to be people out there that might disagree with what I say. Jimmy, do you have I, any I thoughts would, on that? I, I would, I would chime in and agree. Um, I, I, it, whenever someone says, well, why, if, if you think this, why do you think someone else says something different? It's, yeah. I, it's it, I, my inclination is to say, well, you got to ask him. Um, you know, you'd have to ask Bart Ehrman or Robert Price why they take the interpretation they do. Um, at the same time, I would mention, and having just debated Bart Ehrman, um, I would, and it's been a while since I met Bob Price, but um, with both of them, they've both been very nice to me. And I do have obviously profound differences with both of them. Um, and they could be right on, and are right on individual things. Um, but whether they are right on this particular subject, uh, I mean, I if, if they're taking Peter to be the rock, well, I agree with that. But it's because uh, my reasons are my reasons, which I've articulated here, and you'd have to ask them what their reasons are. So let's do this. Let's do some closing thoughts, closing statements from each of you, just overall thoughts on the dialogue today. And we'll, let's start with you, Jimmy, and then we'll leave. Uh, we'll let Stephen have the last word. Okay. Well, um, I very much appreciate uh, coming on to discuss this. Like I said, this is a uh, passage that was central to uh, to my religious life because I was a I was a happy evangelical, and I when I discovered this about it, and it was so obvious, I had to change my position, and I had to say, Jesus made Peter the boss once he assume, once he ascends back into heaven. That means he's the pope. And I didn't know what all the implications of that office would be or whether there would be future popes. Maybe you could draw a firewall there. But um, I said, Catholics are right. Jesus established the church with a pope. And if they were right about that, that means I have to look at every subject with an open mind. And so I took a year while I was in grad school and, um, and went through all of the different categories of systematic theology with an open mind to whether the Catholic position on them were true or not. And as a result of that, I it concluded they, that the Catholic Church was true and that I needed to become a Catholic. But just focused on this, um, I, even if you are a Catholic or, or, or don't think there's a future papacy, I think the argument for Peter being the rock is very strong, which is why it has been held by people throughout church history, including by a large number of Protestant scholars today. Having said that, uh, Stephen has presented uh, his side very vigorously. He's obviously a smart guy. We've been able to be charitable to each other throughout the discussion, and I really appreciate that. And so as a brother in Christ, Stephen, I want to say thank you for engaging in a wonderful discussion, and I hope we can interact more in the future, including on subjects we agree on. Yeah, I, I also would like to thank you, Jimmy, for a, a very um, uh, interesting discussion. And <clears throat> you make a good case. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 
I was listening to some of your stuff uh, recently. I, I think you're a very fascinating person with a lot of very diverse interests, and you always have something interesting to say about everything. So I, I very much appreciated the chance to, to chat with you and to talk to you about this. Um, I do think that Matthew chapter 16 and these particular verses, this is sort of like a crossroads, uh, a theological crossroads. And I think that the way that you interpret this text is really going to send you off into one or the other direction. I think that um, with Jimmy, you see an example of reading this text one way and ending up in the direction of Roman Catholicism, which is a very uh, elaborate and well-defined and, and uh, sort of like internally coherent and, and sort of a fortress of a theological system. Uh, on the other hand, if you interpret things my way, I think that you get pushed in the direction of a kind of a Zwinglianism. Um, and I haven't yet in one place elaborated all the consequences of this, although I've been writing about it and talking about it in, in different places. Um, but notice the difference between our, our, our proposals. Um, Jimmy, for example, thinks that Peter is given a unique office in Christ's church. He's also given a special authority that pertains particularly to that office. And this authority is such that, you know, it, he can make sort of definitive decisions about what is going to fly and what isn't going to fly in the church. Uh, and this office is successional. So you have this entire sort of traditionalist structure of the church, if you want to call it that, um, that comes out by taking Jimmy's reading of this text. Whereas if you take my reading of the text, there's nothing special about Peter at all. The only infallibility that Peter has is when he preaches the gospel, when he preaches Christ's words. And everything that comes from Peter himself could be right, could be wrong. The only time he is guaranteed to be right is when he preaches what Christ himself taught. Um, and that sort of creates a level playing field. That creates... That means that Peter and anybody who is a Christian has the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the extent that they preach the gospel and what they bind is bound in heaven when the consequence, you know, for example, Jimmy referenced this earlier. Um, if you preach the gospel, if you preach what Jesus teaches, for example, if Jesus forbids that you should strike someone who has struck, who has, uh, struck you first, you know, you have to turn the other cheek. When you preach that, you will bind what will have been bound in heaven because God himself does not allow it, and therefore you're not allowing it either on the basis of God's authority. Or, alternatively, if, for example, you allow a person to eat certain foods because Christ himself declared all foods clean, then you will have loosed what will have been loosed in heaven because, once more, you're following God's lead. So I think that here in this passage, we really have a theological crossroads. If you read it Jimmy's way, you get sent in a certain direction, theologically speaking. If you read it my way, you get sent in nearly the exact opposite direction, theologically speaking. Um, so I think that this passage is really fascinating. I think that it's really interesting to see such radically opposed paradigms sort of confront each other over this text. It was very enjoyable for me. I really I really liked chatting with Jimmy about it, and I appreciated the pushback and the, the counter-argumentation. Um, and, you know, hopefully the discussion will continue. Amen. Yeah, this was great. And this is fortunately one of the discussions that, that I've hosted on this channel that I've been able to actually like listen and engage in like the, in the dialogue between the, the two speakers. Usually what happens when I'm hosting a debate is that I'm so focused on things going on behind the scenes that I can't really listen. And that happened today as well. But today I was able to really listen in and it was, it was very, very enjoyable. So thank you both for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. This was awesome. All right. Well, uh, with, with nothing else to say, thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video very soon. So see you guys very soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?